Uh, this morning we have three presenters uh, who are going to take uh, 15 minutes each. Uh, so they are going to go through all their presentations and then we'll have questions at the end. So uh, the person, the first person I am going to ask to introduce herself uh, is Renee, uh, who is reporting on a qualitative grounded theory study on Black Canadians uh, mental health service use. And I will let her introduce herself and where she's located. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me okay? All right, awesome. Um, well, it's great to be here this morning for all of you. My name is Renee Taylor. Um, I have my PhD from the University of Windsor. I'm currently situated in Toronto um, as a psychologist and supervised practice. So uh, psychology is my field. And today I wanna to share with you um, the research from my doctoral study, which is a, a qualitative grounded theory study of Black Canadian mental health service use. All right, here we go. So the research question I wanted to address in my study was why Black Canadians are not using mental health services even when they need them or even when they have a mental health concern. So what we're seeing in literature is that Black Canadians have mental health concerns and they are not accessing services. And previous research has looked at several different factors that have impacted Black Canadian psychological help seeking. And many of these factors are listed here. I won't read them all for the sake of time. Um, what is missing from the literature is a model or a theory that brings multiple factors together and sees how they relate to each other and how they're interconnected. So that was one of the aims for the present study that I'm gonna present with you today is to bring multiple factors together to create this framework and previous researchers, myself included, have tried to create a framework before using pre-existing models. And what we found was that those pre-existing models didn't fit with Black experiences. So the goal for this study was to have a model or a theory that was grounded in the experiences of Black Canadians. So the participants in this study were 15 men and 15 women, so 50-50 split. And the average age was 37 years old, ranging from 16 to I think 62. Participants lived in various regions across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. We had a variety of people with different generational statuses, different countries of origin, and different family histories of origin as well. So in terms of the procedure, I did online interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. The average length for each interview was one hour. And then I recorded all the interviews and transcribed them verbatim. And then all the data was analyzed and collected using Corbin and Strauss um, grounded theory procedures. And if you have questions about what that is, I can answer those um, afterwards. So while I was doing this research study, I asked participants to think about a time when they had an emotional or mental problem that made them very unhappy or caused them distress. And then I also asked them to think about what it'd be like to talk to a mental health professional about this problem. And a mental health professional could be anyone whose job involves addressing mental health concerns. So a counselor, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a psychotherapist, a doctor, a nurse, it could have been multiple different professionals. And what I found was that the vast majority of my participants were not willing to seek help, despite, like, regardless of the severity, duration, or nature of the mental health concern. So here are common concerns that people talked about. So mood, anxiety, substance use, relationship, bereavement, and psychotic symptoms. And it's important to note that these concerns did cause them significant distress and affected their uh, work life, their school life, their relationships, their physical health. It caused suicidal ideation in some cases. So these were some pretty significant concerns. And then I wanted to ask, I wanted to find out what is it that made them not want to seek help from a professional, why they reacted this way. And one thing people said is that they'd be very uncomfortable with this idea. So in this quote, 
Kojo is saying that his discomfort would have stopped him from seeking help, even if he knew it would have been good for him. Another reason was that people said that they didn't think it would be worth the time and the money to go and seek help. So here, Kobla is talking about not really seeing the value in spending that much money. And Kofi is talking about it being a waste of time, so not seeing it as a good use of time. And then the third theme that came up is this feeling of it being shameful or embarrassing. So we see this in Amika's quote where she said she would feel shame. That kept her from reaching out. And here in Abena's quote, she's talking about feeling very embarrassed. So if we recap, we see that these three factors, the discomfort, not seeing the value in it, and that shame and embarrassment is contributing to that unwillingness. unwillingness. So then I wanted to explore that more deeply, like what makes it uncomfortable? What makes people feel like it's not worth the time and the money? And one thing is that people felt they'd be misunderstood by the mental health service provider. So for example, Akwasi is saying that the discomfort would be coming from having a white therapist who maybe doesn't understand him or his experiences, and that would make him not feel comfortable. Another theme was feeling that they might not be treated well or not be treated fairly by the mental health professional. So here, Kosowa is saying that she would worry about not being treated as an equal or not being shit, like not being seen as an equal um, and that affecting the, the treatment that she receives. So now this is what we have so far in the model. And then what we can add to is that feeling of discomfort um, being attributed to thinking I could be misunderstood or I could be mistreated essentially. And I also wanted to explore that theme of the shame and feeling embarrassed. What is that about? So one is that it's contributing from judgments from others. People would be worried about others judging them. And a cow's quote is exemplifying that. He's saying that people would be ashamed because we care about what other people think. So that's that external judgment. And then another source would be a judgment from within the self. So not just from other people. And we can see that in Kosowa's quote, where she's saying that she would judge herself for not being able to handle problems on her own and seeing that as like a weakness. And this is more like an internal judgment. So now we can add on and say that those sources of judgment lead to that feeling of shame and embarrassment. So all of this led to even more questions of like, what makes you think that you might be misunderstood or not treated well? So when I asked my participants that, they said that they feel that mental health service providers don't really understand our experiences or our needs as black individuals. And here we can see Adzo essentially describing mental health professionals as not having our lived experiences and not being able to relate to our experiences. Participants also talked about this theme of the impact of racism and the impact of anti-Black racism. And I feel like Kobla said this really, really well, where he's talking about having a hard time trusting uh, a group of people who tend to see us a certain way and you think, well, how can I open up to this person? So there's that, there's that doubt that you can't really trust them. So now this adds on to, like the model is getting bigger, the theory is growing, right? So we see that this theme of cultural awareness and sensitivity of mental health service providers that's what contributes to this feeling of like, I might be misunderstood, I might not be treated well. And then when explore the judgment from the self and others, I wanted to see where does that come from? <laughs> and people mentioned that in the black community, there tends to be what are considered typical ways of dealing with mental health concerns. So that includes like turning to friends and family or maybe a higher power. So we can see in this quote, Essie is talking about turning to friends and family, so loved ones, but definitely not going to a stranger. That's not okay. And here, Akwasi is talking about 
going to a pastor or a mom or some other spiritual leader. So this is relating again to that higher power or that spiritual coping piece of things. And then there's also this feeling that in the black community, we're supposed to be strong. And this was a strong theme, a very prominent theme among our participants. So here, Koku is saying that we have to suck it up. We have to be strong because that's what we do as black people. And this contributed to that sense of judgment that comes when you need to seek out. So essentially these norms or these expectations feed into that judgment and then that feeds into the shame and the embarrassment that we're seeing in the model. So despite everything that we've seen so far, five minutes, okay. Um, 20 out of the 30 participants in this study did actually use mental health services. So this really added complexity to this study because I wanted to understand why is it that this group sought help but a lot of people didn't. So I asked, you know, what made you go seek help despite your unwillingness? And one thing that came up was that the problem became too severe. They couldn't handle it on their own anymore. Another thing was some sort of external influence or authority like law enforcement or uh, their employer was pressuring them to seek help. And then a third thing was a loved one, a friend, family member encouraging them to seek the help they need. So it's not surprising that having past negative experiences would lead people to have greater unwillingness to seek help in the future. And we can see from Abla's quote mm -hmm. that she felt really misunderstood in her story. And that misunderstanding made her really not want to seek help again in the future. But then having a positive experience, of course, had the opposite effect. People were more willing to seek help in the future. So I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because I know I only have five minutes. But essentially, we're seeing the flip side of what we've already seen before. For example, this person says, I'm more comfortable with it. And here's a quote that he gives or that exemplifies that theme. It's being more comfortable. There's also this view that it's worth the time and the money. So here, Abena is saying, it's invaluable. Like, that's why I wanted to do it. And then also not being ashamed, not being embarrassed. So here, Quedro is saying, it's like a flex, which is like the opposite of being ashamed, he's kind of proud of it. So we're seeing the exact same thing we saw before, but reversed. Essentially, it's the same thing is coming up again, but having the opposite effect. So I'm gonna go through these again quickly, just to skip here, because my point is that having that cultural sensitivity, participants reported that when I felt understood is because the person understood my experiences, they could relate to me. And then we have to explore the second part too. What about the norms? What about the expectations? What about that judgment piece? <coughs> Sorry, I wish I could stop and, and explain them. But essentially when people felt that they didn't have to live according to those expectations, when they felt more comfortable breaking out of those norms and those standards, then they felt like, okay, the judgment piece is there, but it's not gonna impact me as strongly as maybe it did before. All right. So one of the implications of this research is of course, recruiting more mental health professionals who understand the black lived experience, right? And this could be professionals who don't necessarily have like doctoral level education. This could be psychotherapists, counselors, social workers. This could be religious clergy. And then another implication is adopting and promoting anti-racist, culturally humble and multiculturally oriented treatment practices and policies. And this is something that all clinicians can do to help prospective black clients feel more comfortable seeking services and feel more likely or confident that they'll be treated well by their mental health service provider. One more minute. In terms of the limitations of the study, uh, the participants in the study were predominantly employed full-time uh, and at least had secondary level education. So they're relatively highly educated um, 
So people who have lower socioeconomic status or less educated weren't represented in, in the results we see here. And then also I'm a psychologist. So I have a very intrapsychic perspective. Someone who has a more sociological background or social work or critical justice lens might have done the study very differently and seen the data very differently. So it's a very intrapsychic perspective, partially because of the lens that I'm seeing it through. In terms of future directions, what I would wanna do or what future researchers can do is what's called an institutional ethnography. So the participants are talking about you know, mental health service providers, they aren't culturally aware, they're not culturally sensitive. It'd be really interesting to flip that around and do a study from within the mental health service um, organizations and see what's actually happening in these organizations and how are they catering to the needs of the black community. And then lastly, we can take the themes and the concepts from this model and quantify them and see if we can test them using regressions or structural equation modeling. And that is it, I am done. <laughs>an insightful presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we are inviting the next person. And uh, I am going to also ask her to introduce herself, uh, Dr. Evangeline Daseko, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, organizational practices, advancing racial equity, uh, development and validation of organization in an organizational tool. Can I sing now? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm originally from the Philippines where nine out of 10 people can sing and dance. And, and I'm the one out of 10 that cannot do that. Uh, which is why I'm just here and not rapping or singing about this uh, topic. So I, I stand here before you actually to, um, on behalf of my colleagues who have worked on this, and I have some colleagues here who have been part of this work, um, and uh, also uh, with colleagues from another organization called the Children's Mental Health Ontario. Um, if I don't have time to finish through the end, uh, my, my hope is that Essentially, we need a, an organizational approach also, uh, together with that individual level type of approach in terms of addressing systemic racism. So before I start, maybe think about if you're situated in a community or in an organization, Think about what is it that you like about that organization? What are they doing well in terms of addressing racism? You might have to dig deep if you don't find any, but just think of maybe one or two things that they're doing well. Um, before I proceed, I just wanted to acknowledge also that um, we're on unceded um, and uh, surrendered Algonquin land. And there are so many things that I continue to learn and also unlearn. And I'm particularly open to learning more about broadening the worldview where I've been trained on Western worldviews and wanted to know how I can give back to the land and give back uh, to the peoples uh, here. So I'll talk a bit about the context in Ontario, the rationale for organizational factors and the key domain for the tool that we used and uh, the overall summary. Uh, so where I work a little bit um, I work at what's called the Knowledge Institute on Child and Youth Mental Health and Addictions. We're a provincial program. It's uh, based at uh, the hospital here, but it's funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, so we work, we're, we're not researchers. 
uh, we don't deliver services, so we're what we call uh, an intermediary organization, and we're not ministry either. So, but we work, we use research, we use lived experience, and we use policy um, to, to bridge the gap between research and practice. So we work on topics around early years, middle years, teen years, and transition years. And our focus for the past three, four years has been around complex needs and intensive services, integrated care pathways, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which um, I lead uh, most of the efforts here. And uh, we work on uh, youth engagement, family engagement, and community engagement and also supporting a lot of the work around virtual care and also around substance use and addictions. So a little bit about the Mental Health and Addiction Center in Ontario. How many are not from Ontario? Yeah, so, so we know it's supposed to be publicly uh, provided. Um, there are, uh, so what's not here, in this um, in this slide are people that provide private practice or people or who are in community health agencies where they're sort of mandated through another funding stream. Um, but essentially in Ontario, uh, we have five regional geographic regions. Um, Toronto is its its own region. It's its own universe. <laughs> and uh, we have 33 service areas across the province and there are 31 lead agencies. So for each uh, service area, there's one lead agency that coordinates all the mental health services. So for example, those here in Ottawa, it's a youth services bureau that organizes the child and youth mental health services for people uh, within the Ottawa service area and 31 lead agencies because there's um, one lead agency that's um, the lead agency in three service areas. Um, these are some of our provincial partners. So um, a lot of the work that we do at the Knowledge Institute is looking at the uh, provincial uh, sector level. So we have uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario, The New Mentality, which is a youth-driven um, organization, uh, Parents for Children's Mental Health, and School Mental Health Ontario, and the Lead Agency Consortium. So there's different funders. There's the Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Education, and uh, member-based uh, CMHO. There are many other players in terms of the partnerships. And so I'll begin my talk about the work, which is part of um, a broader study. Uh, I said earlier, we're working with uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario. And um, th this work that we have was the foundation for trying to establish um, a racial equity strategy uh, for the province, which has the buy-in from all those uh, 170 plus uh, child and youth mental health agencies. So we know during the start of the pandemic, uh, we led a study actually that looked at um, the virtual care and how it was implemented across the province. And very quickly, one of the things we found was that um, there were problems relating to equity. And so around November, 2020, we, we um, met together with the Children's Mental Health Ontario and the Lead Agency Consortium to see what we could do. Um, so what happened also was there were many agencies that started um, uh, putting out their um, position statements that they're anti-racist and they're committed to being anti-racist. And um, 
there are many organizations that uh, decided to do uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And we wanted to see what were some of the things that others are doing. Um, is that enough? And we know it's not enough. <laughs> and so this, um, this work essentially is trying to see what else, what else can we do and how can we go about um, in a coordinated fashion trying to address or what are some things people might want to consider when trying to put together a strategy at the individual agency level and also uh, for, for the sector at large. So uh, we embarked on the study um, to find what's the current state. And we wanted to contribute also to the limited research around organizational practices. And I have five minutes. Um, so this is the serve the where I'm going to focus on the surveys. Um, it had five domains and 40 items, 102 responses, most of them from uh, the executive directors. We had only one response per agency. So these are 98 English that we're doing for this analysis. Um, and this is the five domains of the literature review and what we ended up with in terms of um, the areas for the uh, addressing systemic racism at an agency level. And you can see uh, the key takeaway is the organizational leadership and commitment that's, um, that's quite crucial. And if you don't have that, um, try to have it. <laughs> and, um, and um and yeah and so all there are all these other areas that really spring from the leadership uh, commitment and we also used an implementation science approach um, where we asked agencies is this something that's not in place are you working on it or starting to work on it and three is they're using it and there's evidence of its use uh, the limitation is we didn't ask them to provide us that evidence. Um, so or essentially all the scales had very good, what we call reliability and validity. Um, and this one around the leadership and commitment, looking at the culture, accountability mechanisms, involvement of the board. Um, some examples, uh, there's support for difficult conversations around racial equity, there's public commitment uh, to racial equity, there are policies and procedures in place, there's a written plan um, in terms of intersectoral and um, cross-sectoral work. Uh, there are three items, again, uh, the reliability, if it's more than 0.8, um, it's supposed to be good. And um, as we know, um, in you know, because of um, social determinants of health, it's very important to have those partnerships in place. And these are some examples: their relationships, or their formal relationships, or informal relationships. And in terms of workforce diversity and development, um, this relates to. Uh, having diverse staff, but also enhancing staff knowledge and skills. And um, some examples, uh, supporting policy, supporting recruitment and retention, um, and that racial justice is actually incorporated into the performance objectives. Um, here, this is where we have the culturally responsive programs. So for those who want to implement culturally responsive programs, it's actually a good idea to look at what are all those other things in place, um, because it's not just about implementing culturally responsive programs. So we found um, there's, a, uh, there's a lot in terms of you know, provision of languages other than English or French, or that clients can access culturally relevant services. 
or that if they don't have it, that they know where to refer um, clients. <coughs> and continuous improvement where they're actually collecting and using data. Um, and here we found there's hardly, there are very, very few that collect race-based data to plan for programs and services. And that there are very few also who collect race-based data on staff. Um, so quickly, we did also the factor analysis. Uh, we landed on an eight-factor solution. Essentially, it um, provides confirmation that um, uh, around, sorry, I got, I went too fast. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I just wanted to mention about the summary a bit. Um, so essentially, we have these tools that integrate organizational domains to ensure that there is a comprehensive effort around addressing institutional racism. And it's a multifaceted approach. You know, it's a system. So one thing affects the other. And um, that this tool... Uh, shows promise. It's uh, again a small part. Um, we actually also had uh, case studies of 10 agencies that had somehow uh, very good scores or very high scores. And so they were promising. Uh, they So we have those 10 agencies. And we have our website. So please check our website for the resources and some of um, the tools that we have, we're also going to be developing one. Uh, we're going to release one uh, next week, November 1st at eight o'clock <laughs> <laughs> around um, how to implement an overview of culturally adapted um, programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so there are, we have the last presenter uh, this morning, uh, who is uh, Chantal Curry, uh, and I will ask her to introduce herself. She will be talking about uh, mental health promotion and mental illness prevention in uh, Black and racialized communities in Canada. The floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, my first time having one of these. I feel like I'm on a TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing today, first of all? Hi. Good, good. I'm loving the energy of this conference. It's been so great just observing and seeing just the community that everyone's building and how we're all connecting. And um, that's essentially what I'll be talking about with my presentation today. So my name is Chantal Carey, and I am the Mental Health Promotion Coordinator at Women's Health and Women's Hands Community Health Center. We are located in uh, downtown Toronto, and we provide uh, primary health care services to racialize um, women, trans, and non-binary communities um, in Toronto, as well as Toho GTA and outside as well. Um, yeah, so... The project that I have uh, to coordinate um, under the PHAC funding program um, is now called, this is a long name, I know, but there's a nice story around this, um, the Empowered ACB Women's and Gender Diverse People's Gathering Project. And actually, it should say Wellness Gathering. Um, so, so, oops, something. Oh, this isn't, apologies on the layout. I don't know why it looks like this, but um, so with this project, um, the project overview is to offer uh, mental wellness programming uh, to ACB women and gender diverse peoples in the community. Uh, we have virtual workshops that are available in Toronto, Windsor, Hamilton, Ottawa. Uh, the eligibility to join as workshop participants is 16 years and older and must identify as ACB. Our project objectives 
uh, were to increase availability of gender responsive and evidence informed and culturally focused mental health promotion, increase the capacity um, of ACB women to provide leadership in addressing barriers to mental health in their communities, uh, increase ACB women's access to and participation in gender responsive evidence informed uh, pro mental health programming and strengthening an understanding of social support, bless you, uh, for mental health promotion among ACB women. Uh, and our final objective is to enhance understanding and fostering collaboration among organizations uh, and agencies serving ACB women. So the long-term goal of our project is to improve the mental health um, and well-being of ACB women and gender diverse people. So I so apologize for these slides. I don't know why it's looking like this, but <laughs> okay. Um, so essentially um, what our project focused on is uh, centering heal healing and wellness, right? And so we wanted to be able to uh, provide a safe space um, just to support one's mental wellness journey, right? Um, for both communities, so yes, our participants, but also our peers that are involved in the projects and ensuring that they are culturally, um, the curriculum is culturally relevant. So I'll give you a bit of a backstory. So um, this pro project, we initially um, were to work with the organization, um, they were, you know, we worked very well with them, um, CMHA Ontario. And so they had a model from their BC uh, partners uh, that we were to adapt, right? Called Living Life to the Full. Um, and so uh, with this project, you know, the project staff, so myself and as well as our partner staff attended this training great. It was a two-day training right before the pandemic, so just putting all those pieces in there, right? Um, and we also recruited peers. Um, we trained peers in this model, and I will pause there before we get there. <laughs> So, uh, and just to give you a brief timeline, so this was just as the pandemic was starting, right? So it's already in, you know, 2020, we're already by funders timeline a year late, right? <laughs> so um, we did this training. And so I'm looking at this and I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure how this may resonate with our community, right? Um, with the training. So while the training, it was an, an eight week series of um, CBT uh, workshops, right? That was able to provide tools and resources to help manage stress and, and mental health. However, the language in it, we found it to be a bit problematic. It didn't really relate or resonate with us culturally. The examples that were used um, in that training model, um, just did not match with, with us and what we wanted to do. And we wanted to be able to adapt this. However, it was very, um, that model was very rigid with what we were able to change. And so there was a lot of kind of pushback, like, no, we're not able to change even the examples, the language. Um, it didn't um, allow for discussion um, of of our as 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 the black community in terms of multiple pandemics um, with anti-black racism and microaggressions, um, so it didn't really allow for that conversation and how how that can translate into what we go through every day. Um, so our peers came back from this training and said, you know, I don't know that I feel comfortable um, being trained to facilitate workshops in the community uh, using this model. So we said, okay, we went to our community advisory committee um, that consisted of um, some project staff or um, some peers, um, sorry, at that point, not peers, but um, project staff, some uh, community members, as well as some of our mental health team from Women's Health. And, you know, they reviewed the workshop materials and it was 
it was a no-go. Um, so they said, well, let's have some community consultations and see what, what is it that, that our community wants around, you know, how can we support each other, support ourselves, um, you know, as we are having these challenges with mental health, right? Um, so we had a community consultation. It was virtual. It was in June of the pandemic. And, um, and so through that, um, uh, sorry. So through, through that um, consultation, um, some themes came out of what people wanted to see in workshops. So we, you know, consulted with them in terms of what would you want to see in, in workshops, right? Like what would your programming look like? Um, you know, how do you want to feel coming out of it? Like, and so um, information that came out of it was that um, uh, folks wanted some more connection around spirituality um, to be more creative. So we wanted more arts, music involved, um, a space for us to just kind of let our hair down and, and connect and not have to explain ourselves. Um, and so uh, community building. Um, so a lot of these themes came up with that. So what we ended up doing, um, we actually had to start from scratch with the project. That's fine. So we actually had to start from scratch. So we're just starting out this funding project and it's like, oh my goodness, we have to start all over because this model is not gonna work. So <laughs> what we ended up doing um, was looking to develop a new model. And so we created a sub-working group that included the advisory committee. And then we wanted to bring the peers on board, right? Because we had already recruited them um, to be trained uh, in this model and deliver workshops in the community. So we invited the peers. We had the subcommittee working group. We did a lit scan of kind of what other models are out there um, that are supporting um, wellness journeys, like what, what interventions are out there that can help us cope with the challenges in life, right? Um, so through uh, the feedback from the community consultations, from the peers, the lid scans, uh, we actually worked together with the peers um, as well and created new workshop content, uh, focusing on those themes such as spirituality, community unity, and self-care. Um, what we did though was keep the framework of the model. So it was an eight week uh, workshop. And so we did keep the, we developed a series of eight week workshops, two hour workshops that were virtual, and it resulted in the name change of the project. Um, so the original project was called uh, ACB uh, Living Life to the Full, and we then changed it to um, the Empowered uh, ACB Women's and Gender Diverse uh, Wellness Gathering Project. And that came about because we asked the peers, okay, well, how do you want to feel with, with this work that you're doing, right? Um, in terms of as we reach out to community, what, like, how do you want to be supported in this? And so that's how we essentially came up with, with that name. Um, so with the workshop themes, um, so out of the eight workshops, uh, the first workshop was um, the intro workshop, and we talked about safety, um, emotion regulation and some um, other psychoeducation that, that was offered. The second workshop focused on spirituality and poetry. The third one was positive affirmations. Fourth is goal setting, fifth storytelling. Sixth is a movement piece. The seventh workshop is stress management. And the eighth workshop was vision boarding. Um, and so all of these themes uh, were connected with mental health. And at the end of the eight weeks is the vision board. Uh, the participants receive, um, so they have a participant package, which has a series of exercises and um, were journal reflections. And so at the end of this eight week series, they, they have created their vision board, right? And so they can go back and reflect and see how uh, this can um, help support them in, in their journey. 
Um, so just some participant feedback that I would like to share. Um, so we have, you know, some folks said, you know, they love the project. The experience helped me with some tips when I have anxiety attacks. It is great to talk about mental health and be exposed to the resources available in a safe space. I enjoyed my experience in this program so much. I appreciated the community and togetherness I felt with the women in our group. This project was very informative and allowed me to understand more about my own mental health and stigma surrounding mental health in general. The group leader was very supportive and knowledgeable. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. So nice we had to do it twice. I really enjoyed the workshops. I felt like I had a space to come into every week where I can just unwind, relax and share space with amazing people. Every week was different. There was the dance hall, workout class, vision board, storytelling, positive affirmations, and so much more. I'm happy I had the chance to partake in these activities and hope more of them will come back in the near future. Thank you so much for all of this. I really needed it and don't think I really knew how much it has helped. It was so, so helpful to be in a predominantly queer Black space by accident or not. I hope I can participate in one of these again. Really, really an amazing facilitator. Oh man, this was really good. I could not have asked for a better facilitator. Was understanding, clear, engaged, honest, supportive, encouraging to have other participants empower themselves and facilitate at times. And um, I know I'm wrapping up right now. So I also wanted to include peer feedback because at the center of this project is about wellness, right? And so I always drive home with our peers. We're out in the community. Yes, you're facilitating workshops, but we also have to remember that we are all part of community too and making sure that we continue to center ourselves in healing and wellness. We're not separate, we're not apart. We need to take time and make sure that we are okay as well, right? And so from some peer feedback, um, you know, and we have peers, we're in year four of the project now. And so we've had some peers stay on, some have moved on and created other groups of their own. But here's some feedback from the peers that, you know, they personally gained a lot of knowledge from the sessions and became a stronger facilitator overall. Um, you know, and so it's been wonderful to feel trusted and valued and create workshop content that more accurately reflects myself and participants. Um, I love that this program also centers us in community and assures we take space to prioritize our self-care and mental health needs. So we're just wrapping up, but I just wanted to let you know in terms of the different program offerings we've had. So we've had a series of community talks um, with uh, Simone Donaldson with Agape Lands Consultant, and she has led some community healing circles that we've had just sent out to the wider community through Instagram and that where we talked about the, I know Regine, you're about to give me that music. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wrapping up, I promise. Um, um, yeah, so we talked about in the Healing Circle series, you know, just un unpacking that strong Black woman narrative. Um, a lot of the conversations that came up both in this Healing Circle as well as in the workshops with um, the peers was, you know, allowing yourself, feeling safe and being vulnerable and just... Um, being okay with not being okay. Like you don't have to be strong all the time. It's fine, you know? Um, and so also we offered capacity building with peers. So peers were able to engage in research. They actually, because they were recruited when the project started, but we had to start over, they were actually involved from the ground up, right? Um, they, so, and they also contributed to the workshop development. So the workshops that they're using. Um, and they're also able to um, modify the workshops depending on their group and what other experience they bring into the field. Um, and some have gone on to start their own support groups online. We also have uh, mental health support for peers. Um, and so we were able to do this one year um, where we actually had uh, women's health as placement students. And so what we did was that 
the placement student is getting masters in social work, is getting supervised by our therapists. Our peers also need support, but we know limited funding. So how can we be creative and provide support for peers? I'm sorry, but our <laughs> students were able to support the peers to offer group sessions and one-on-one -on -one sessions while also getting the um, supervision training from our therapists and just connecting peers and participants back to women's health, offering them our services, whether it's therapy, food bank, anything that we have. And of course, it's a peer-led study. Uh, I can share more of the tools of the actual workshops. Um, I think the program, the funders have all the information and they all have that. And this was just some project challenges that you can see up here, <laughs> right? I'm finishing, I know, right? Um, so yeah, some participant recruitment and just things that we need to see. And then this is what's next. Okay, and I'm actually hey. finished. Thank you. <laughs> now I invite uh, all the presenters to come to the front and uh, uh, answer some of the questions you may have. I see some hands up already. Uh, so I uh, will take the mic to... Okay, the questions, uh, then... Uh, Sorry, we're debating if we have to use the microphone or not. We're both like, we're loud. <laughs> um, so some people in this room know that I am very proud of Renee. I got to watch her work from the beginning. So my question is to you to make sure that people can understand this. You were able to have a 50% male to female ratio in qualitative data with like obviously men and women um, across Canada and the black community. And I think it was really impactful that you were able to do that. And I'm wondering tips and tricks that you can give to everyone to have that success, to get those numbers in such a beautiful, wonderful way. Thank you, Odin. Uh, this is my, my biggest promoter. I need to pay her. And just, just... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, but for this study, I, well, one of the things I did was connect with people, people like Odian, and uh, she was with the Africa Center in Alberta. So really part of it was finding different organizations in the country where this issue matters to them and seeing, okay, do you want to be involved with this? Can you help me with this? So that was one part of it. And then another part of it was kind of a snowballing thing because once I got people interested and they did it and they're like, oh, this is great. I want to tell people about it. And I was like, yes, please do tell <laughs> people about it. Um, so I think that's the second thing is like you people who, who care about the, the topic. Um, and then the third thing, social media and persistence. I think that's a big thing too, is that a lot of people will say no. A lot of people will be not, not interested. But the more you keep pushing, the more you keep asking, you'll find people who do care and who are interested in them. And be creative, like, you know, with your promotional uh, material, don't just have like a Word document that has the bare minimum, like make it look nice and make it appealing. Uh, so I think that's the best I would say for that. Yeah, thank you for your question. <laughs> thank you for your work. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. So I think you have touched base about uh, uh, cost as a barrier, and I don't know if you have further questioned in that area, if the cost of I mean, paying for a service is uh, one of the barriers, because mm -hmm. I know OHIP only in Ontario, OHIP only covers yeah. some cost of health service. Right. And uh, uh, that is one question. And the other thing is, I, I, I also doubt if you have a little bit dug around some kind of community-based services, because, I mean, in my culture and in most Black culture, people only go to seek service once mm -hmm. it's full-blown, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But at early stage, do we have some kind of services in the community where we can refer to for example uh, mm -hmm. from the i'm not a lawyer but yeah. uh, there is a legal clinic right where right. people who have a low income go to mm -hmm. to seek legal services right. something like that not only for mental health but for any other services thank you okay um so your first question was about the cost being a barrier and um it is interesting because a lot of people will say that they have the funds, but they have other things to spend it on, 
right? There, there are other things that are more of a priority. So, and I, I have to preface this by saying that my sample, like I said, they were employed full time. These aren't people who are, you know, barely paying rent or who can't keep the lights on. So that's like another issue that I didn't really get a chance to explore in the study. So theoretically, these are people who could afford it, but they thought, no, 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 there are other things I need to spend my money on, right? And I think if we're looking at another sample, they might say, well, like, I'm not even thinking about my mental health because I got to get food. I need to, mm -hmm. you know, support my kids. I, like, I'm not, am I depressed? I don't know. Like, I have other things to worry about, right? Um, so that's the cost question. And then your second question about community services. The funny thing is that they exist, but a lot of people don't know about them. And I think a big part of what we need to do is making that more known. And I think one of the questions I got from my participants the most was, well, where, do, where should I go? Like, can you recommend places for me to go to? Um, and even I wish I knew more. Like I even, even I wish I could say, here are some places, I can maybe name three, but I'm, I'm sure there's so much more out there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can add also um, that, um, we have uh, in our uh, organization, we're working with uh, to build school community pathways because uh, kids uh, for the early intervention or early prevention, that's where kids are, right? They're in school. And so um, through a Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education effort, they're uh, working on those pathways and there are mental health leaders that are being identified within all the school boards across Ontario. Um, there's also funding now, there are new, um, what are being called youth wellness hubs, uh, Ontario. So it's YWHO. And um, the principle is that, again, you go where the young people are. And so uh, for this, uh, the mental health services in the community are co-located with other uh, community services, uh, say for employment, for in, for uh, for food, <laughs> for for any or even physical activities, that sort of thing. Um, I just want to thank all of you for this amazing presentation altogether. Um, my question is for Chantal. I work at a rape crisis center, and I have a question pertaining to your virtual workshops that are offered, mm -hmm. um, being that our center is in Ottawa. Uh, I just wanted to know, how is it that you manage um, effectively people being triggered during those sessions? Like what type of strategies do you use or employ? And my other question really quick is, um, is it possible for uh, agency representatives such as myself to attend at least a sample session to give our clients an expectation as to what they can experience? Hi, great question. Um, and we will definitely will have to link for sure. So please get my email so we can we can chat. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in terms of um, uh, managing triggers, we did have some um, training and tools for peers uh, themselves in terms of um, uh, kind of working together, um, you know, um, with, we, we, we had volunteers as well join. Um, the, the peers so that they won't have to facilitate alone. And so that if they need to take time and, you know, um, take a break, let's say something arising at the moment, right? You can kind of sense the room engage and say, okay, well, maybe we need to take a little pause and then invite that person into a breakout room with you and them while the volunteer might, you know, do another exercise or have folks, you know, grab some tea or just take a moment like that. Um, and so we, depending on if the peer was comfortable with, you know, connecting with that individual uh, in that breakout room, they would also connect with them after the session. Um, you know, once it's finished, you know, they will contact that participant and follow up. And um, all participants and peers receive like a resource packet for mental health services. So a direct pathway to connect with us at Women's Health and Women's Hands to do our therapy services, um, as well as other um, 
mental health um, that specifically service ACD folks, we put those resources towards the top and then the other broader uh, mental health services that folks can access. Um, and then also just, you know, a lot of that too was um, unpacking like safety and really setting that up from the start of the workshop. So what does that mean, right? So when you have your group in a room and really, you know, building that trust, right? And having those conversations and breaking that down and, you know, just, um, ensuring that, you know, like we're all here to support each other and and um, really reinforcing that, right? Because sometimes there were stories that, you know, and as I say, a lot of this data and research that comes out is a lot of anecdotal, right? So there's a lot of stories and qualitative things that come out, but that's so impactful because I'm hearing from my peers and participants that email, email me afterwards and they're like, oh my goodness, like, you know, they're sharing some really traumatic stuff, but the fact that they had each other, like some folks that they felt like just, they were envelopes in love. You know what I mean? And just to be able to just share and knowing that it's okay, like, you know, if you're triggered, like it's okay to cry, scream, right? Like we had sessions where you could just scream into the mic, right? <laughs> and just really be safe to kind of let that out. Um, but we definitely made sure to, um, connect them with um, our mental health therapists uh, afterwards, like right after for sure. Mm -hmm. And sorry, the next question, it was triggers and- You could just- Oh, if you could sit in. So- Not into the specific ones. Mm -hmm. Right, but I could send you, like we'll have the toolkit that I think is available that will be available. I know the, the, there's a working group with the founders that's, build, that's building a repository of all the tools, um, but I can also send you kind of like the participant package. Um, and if anyone else wants to receive that too, I can send that to you as well in terms of um, what the actual activities are and, and going about um, all of those things. You. You're welcome. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you all for the wonderful presentation. Um, my question is for Renee. Um, I'm just wondering, for the course you shared, mm -hmm. did you change the names? Okay. All right. Because that make that's because I they, noticed they were all West African. Names. That's right. Yes. Um, and a lot of them are specific, specifically from Ghana. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if it's based like I wasn't sure where you did. Um, the study from and so was it particularly Ghanaians who refused to see um no. you know therapists mm -hmm. or was it okay so that's so it's a good question I chose West African names mostly just to do something different okay. you know oftentimes when you see qualitative research they'll say participant one or two or they'll use like western names like <laughs> Sarah or Katie or John or Joe and I thought no let me do something different um but no the participants were some of them were immigrants from Ghana. I think I had a couple, maybe three or four who were born in Ghana, but I had people who were born in Canada, at least half of the sample were born in Canada, who had African heritage, who had Jamaican heritage, who had Haitian heritage, a lot of Caribbean heritage um, from British Columbia, from Alberta, from the East Coast, a lot of from Ontario. So um, no, not just Ghanaians. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentations, the, the, to, to all of you. It's, uh, it's been fantastic to be at this conference and to, to be seeing all the, the, uh, uh, black academics, especially some of the younger ones who are doing great work. Um, my question is for Chantal. Um, I certainly came to this workshop because the, I'd heard great things about, uh, women's hands and women's health before this conference and actually at the conference too. And actually there was a, Somebody yesterday was a regime who said that they couldn't get a job somewhere else, but you guys gave them a job. I forget who that was, but um, my, so I'm with a group called the 613819 Black Hub. We're a, a, a police abolitionist group here in Ottawa. Uh, the uh, folks who are, who are opponents to abolition uh, are reformists, right? And they often talk about reforms, think we need more training, that kind of thing. Did, do you hear, did you hear anything from the people you spoke to or that you speak to on a regular basis who say, that is one of the things that they want to improve their mental health, either more 
training for police and who just go off and do the training or for them to meet with police. And that's the, that'll help them. Yeah. So I didn't actually get to share the consultation like results and um, all of that, but that some of those um, concerns did come up in terms of the wider community consultations that we had when we were looking at the programming and, you know, we asked questions in terms of like, you know, in, not just in terms of what you want to see, but in terms of like what are the issues and things, right. And people want to see, um, you know, police reform, police defunding, um, you know, and just better interaction or more interaction with more community-based community, community um, um, interventions with de-escalation and, and um, support. So we did kind of see those calls, but is that you offer that kind of training? Not. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, it's me. Um, my question is for Renee. So thank you for sharing your doctoral work with us. And I'm a huge fan of qualitative research myself. So my question to you is, you know, some of the factors that you highlighted in terms of uh, people not wanting to access services is like, you know, I would believe because I'm a psychotherapist and I work with clients that they're common across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Like the shame, the embarrassment, like the hopelessness. What is the point of going into accessing some of that stuff? And of course, then the piece around not having enough Black mental health professionals. So I was wondering if your research was able to look into the salience of some of these factors, just to see what is the dominating force, right? I think it's, yeah, that's a good question. The salience of the factors. Um, I guess I could... I would say the themes that come up the most, whatever I heard the most, I would say would be the most salient or mm -hmm. the, the strongest. Um, and I, I would say that comfort piece came up so much. Like, can I be comfortable? Can I relate to this person? And if I'm thinking in like therapy terms, like empathy, can I be understood, right? right? Can this person really listen to me and not question what I'm saying and really like really get into my experience? So I think that's what people said the most. And that really stands out because being a Black person in, in Canada comes with a lot of this, like a lot of racism. There's microaggressions. There are a lot of things that are very common in our experience that if you don't live it, it's hard to really understand it. And that connects to that theme of having more representation. Um, and again, that theme of being understood, can this person relate to me? So I think that's the biggest one that came out um, and that's the most salient in a way because almost everything is connected to like my experience and how is that going to be understood. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask when well, maybe one last question uh, uh, to Evangeline. Uh, the organization you are aiming organizational change. Are there organizations that indicated that they are not interested? <laughs> yeah. We, we tried to use a strengths-based approach. <laughs> and um, uh, so we, our target was some of the 170 or so agencies, right? And our response rate, so with 102 uh, agencies that responded and just wanted to say also, so we have those lead agencies and the other agencies within the service areas, all the lead agency um, executive directors or they, they actually, um, there was a hundred percent response rates from those agencies. So in a sense, uh, it's nice to see that the lead agencies are doing something <laughs> relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but uh, yes, very interesting question about how come people are not getting on board. Um, we, from one of the focus groups that we did, <clears throat> there, there was one executive director who, act, who was saying, you know, we, we need to actually focus on this um, because also we're, we we're in a she, she's it's in a rural area in Ontario and so even if it's just focusing on working with our indigenous communities 
uh, we need to get out of our uh, headspace in terms of how we deal, how we conceptualize mental health services. Um, so that's one. And um, we're working with the uh, um, Children's Mental Health Ontario, uh, CMHO, that's uh, developing the provincial wide um, equity strategy for all the agencies. So all the executive directors and their director levels also who are part of that effort. And um, I think any day now, maybe we're hoping uh, that uh, that mental health strategy will be issued because uh, it's trying to galvanize that um, that buy-in and the commitment from all the from like what I said from the top from the agency leaders. And if I can remind you also, I asked you earlier in terms of what were those things you noted as what's working for you and see if they land within some of those domains that I mentioned. If it's around the leadership, then it's amazing that you have that in your organization, that there's buy-in and commitment. And if not, that's probably something that I would suggest you find allies in your organization to help work towards those efforts. A question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, maybe one or two more questions and then we stop. Thank you for all the presentations. Evangeline, keep the mic. <laughs> um, this question's for you. So I, if I caught all the information um, quickly enough, I think that you'd shared that there was, um, the breakdown was that um, there was about 12.7% of the respondents that identified as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. And then you also shared that through the work, there wasn't necessarily any proof of action um, mm -hmm. on what was being reported on. So it does lead me to wonder um, if there's a possibility that the scores that came out of the, the research yes. or study um, may were possibly higher based on perception. And it has kind of a part two question yes. is whether or not there's kind of future plans to engage with um, more of the staff or recipients yes. of the service at each of those organizations. Yeah, great, great comment, great observation. And in fact, that was one of our recommendations that, um, so we did after the, um, uh, at the end when we had all the results from each agency, we provided uh, individualized result for them. And, uh, and the intent was for them to then use that as um, a process for having conversations with staff or redoing the survey with, if they have a committee that's working on stuff and, and it becomes then a tool for uh, developing a plan for action, but also surfacing. Like, I think we're, we're on a number one here. One person thinks we're a number three, one other says, we're actually number five and we're doing very well. So it becomes a tool for conversations, but uh, definitely that's um, some of the uses of the tools and also the limitations. Thank you very much. I will ask my, the last question if nobody else is asking. Uh, <laughs> the question would be for Rene. Uh, were there uh, participants uh, who actually find that a comfort level with a uh, therapist or psychologist who are not a black? Did they find a comfort level with someone who was who not felt black? comfortable, especially those who had positive experiences? I There were. There were a few people who, especially people who went and sought help because they felt like they had no choice. So if their problem was so severe, they're like, well, I'm doing this and I have no choice but to do it. And they start and they have someone who really felt like they cared for them. So maybe at the beginning, at the outset, they felt like, no, I'm not comfortable with it. But being in the experience, finding someone they could connect with, even if they weren't Black, even if they didn't, didn't have the same experience, they did say like, yes, I was comfortable while I did it, but the discomfort kept me from wanting to go, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I comment. <laughs> uh, we have peer workshops that will be continuing in January. So if you know people that want to attend them or um, 
yeah, attend the workshops and also connect with us at Women's Health and Women's Hands. We do have legal um, assistance offered. So um, that's all our services are free. So I heard a comment around uh, how do people access legal, free legal services. We have a partner that comes in once a month to connect with clients. So if clients have any questions or anything about navigating any type of legal situation, they can come to our center. And we have a food bank, free yoga programming, trauma-informed, one-on-one -on -one yoga um yeah so we're free we're here just you know register to become a client we're in toronto yes but we do have a lot of programs that are virtual due to the pandemic um and we are trying to work on um improving like access for folks in some in some circumstances to get down so just just contact us right like we'll try and find a way to get you to us or us you like just yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. It's just a really, really short statement um, that I want us to be careful of. Because um, in doing frontline, but also in being a supervisor of a program, um, what I really want to be careful is that we don't pigeonhole a lot of the Black youth or Black um, adults and assuming automatically that they want a black therapist, right? So, because if we start doing that, then we're bringing in our own biases and we're negating the fact that this is an individual who may not want a black therapist, especially in a small yeah. community where you may have people from the same culture. So I just needed to put that out there. I, can I add to the comment? Is it because it's a very valuable comment because people even in my study would say like, what if it's somebody who knows somebody that I know? Right. And then that can become a whole thing. So, yeah, thank you for making that comment. Can I piggyback on that? Okay. Um, Perfect. So I'm just going to piggyback on that because that is so valuable. And um, with the counseling clinic that we run out of Alberta, we find that sometimes we can leverage the fact that we'll use black counselors from outside of Edmonton with virtual appointments and then they'll feel better that way, especially if there's a language situation happening. However, it really just comes down to the cultural responsiveness and the need of the issue. So sometimes we can have youth that will come to us and say, the reason I don't want to talk to a white person is because let's say my teacher in university is really triggering me. I don't want someone who looks like that. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've had, and I can even say from experience, one time I had a black therapist who looked and sounded like my mother and she's half the reason for my issues. Like, I don't need that. Right. <laughs> So <laughs> it's, it's about being mindful that the Black therapist isn't necessarily the answer, right? And even to, as Black people, we have our own biases and we have our own unlearnings and healings to do too. And sometimes we can bring that into our clients and into our appointments and the various work that we do. So the end all be all isn't just having a Black therapist. The end all be all is being aware being supportive and offering options, yeah. right? Whether it's old or young or a middle-aged white lady, like there's those things. And even to when we start dealing with the intersect of mixed race, that can be very impactful and age or immigration. And so I love that you brought that up and there are ways around it to navigate it. But the most important thing is to ask our youth and our adults and our seniors, what do you want? Who do you want to talk to? Who do you feel safe talking to? Because like, again, I know I feel the best with a middle-aged white lady, like sign me up, but not everybody else is going to do that, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh